Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If I get no other exercise during the week, <laughs> at least I get it on Sunday. <laughs> I couldn't believe how uh, short a time it seems like running all the way there, all the way back, all the way up the sound room, all the way back. Uh, and you guys had already finished. All right, well, let's take our hymnals, or excuse me, your Bibles. You can tell I'm confused this morning. Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 6, which is the passage that I read just a few moments ago. We've been looking at the genealogies. This is the third week on that that are included uh, here in this passage. Some rather significant genealogies. And we saw how last week they tied in with the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ and how important genealogies are as far as God is concerned. In the course of our study, we have first of all looked at the foundation for genealogies in the Bible. We started the genealogical passages in the Bible by remembering several important things. First, Bible genealogies are inspired by God, and we can never overlook that fact. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for a proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture includes the genealogies. Secondly, we saw that genealogies are important to God for four specific reasons. Genealogies uh, are included when other things were excluded. God limited what he included in the inspired word, and God only put into the inspired word what is important for us to know. He only included profitable things for us, and that's clearly stated in 2 Timothy 3.16. And those profitable things include four different items. Number one, doctrine. Genealogies are profitable for doctrine. We'll see some of that today. Number two, he included genealogies for reproof. And clearly, genealogists teach us God's reproof as you look at what God did with these various people. The third thing that it teaches us is correction. God worked sovereignly in the lives of sinful people to turn them in the right directions. That's correction. And we can see illustrations of how he did that as we study the genealogies. And then finally, it's for instruction in righteousness. These are all four of those things are listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And as we study the genealogies, we see how God instructed people in righteousness. And that is an example for us. Paul tells us so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Those things happened as examples for us. And so as we study the genealogies, it helps us to mature, thorough, uh, uh, mature spiritually because God gave us that purpose also in 2 Timothy 3.16 to make the man of God perfect, that is, truly furnished, unto all good works. So as you study genealogies, it will help you to mature spiritually. Some rather important items there that most Christians never in their entire lives bother to study. Now last week we looked at the fourth major point that God teaches when we study genealogies, and that is how sin permeated the entire human race. The genealogies were one of the clearest indicators of this as we read the phrase, and he died. That occurs over and over and over and over again in scripture. And he died. Those genealogies remind us that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death over and over and over through the 6,000 years of human history that we have known, death, death, death. The wages of sin is death. And as you look at the genealogies, God is emphasizing that point. The wages of sin is death. God emphasizes that point in multiple ways in Scripture. We looked at four of them last week. Not only the genealogies, but the blood sacrifices. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The third thing, rec the record of sin of even the greatest men in the Bible is given to us, such as David and Abraham. No man is great in the sight of God because of his own personal righteousness. Even the greatest men in the Bible were sinners, and their sins are clearly recorded for us. And then finally, the clear statements of Scripture, God tells us, There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes 7.20, and you all know Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. The fifth thing that we learned last week was God uses genealogies that teach us the history 
of redemption from sin. God uses genealogies to teach us the history of redemption from sin. They show us that God worked over long stretches of human history from the state of innocence and from God's from man's fall from that state of innocence and then God's incredible and complex and patient and loving intersection in human history in the lives of individual men to bring about his plan of redemption. We saw how the incarnation uh, was the fulfillment of a great promise that God had made in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And we saw that God fulfilled that promises of Genesis 3.15 by recording the genealogies. And we read some of the genealogies of our Lord Jesus Christ and looked at the genealogies here in Exodus chapter 6 and noted that most of those people are people that we have never ever heard of. Or at least we may have read their names once when we were doing our Through the Bible reading so we can get a certificate at the end of the year. But it did not stick. We don't know anything at all about them even in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember I gave you a little test and you were supposed to count on your fingers how many of those people you knew absolutely for sure? <laughs> and most of us couldn't come up with five, much less ten of them. People that you knew something about for sure and could tell me back. Because many of those people have the same names as you go through that genealogy. As you look at your own genealogies, there are probably people in your lineage that have the same name that you do. So which one was which? Do you know who they are? How many of you can go back to your great, great, great grandparents and tell me their names on both sides of the family? You think you could do it? We well, might know your grandpa and grandma's first name, but great grandpa and great grandma, could you give me their first name, their middle name? I mean, how short our human memory is. But God's human memory, huh, he doesn't have what we call a human memory, God's memory goes back to every person that was ever born on the face of the earth, every child that was ever conceived. He knows us all. He knows us by name. He knows the stars by name. There are a lot more stars than there are people. Think about that. Individuals are named in the mind of God. God uses it to show us that Every one in that genealogy was an essential link in God's plan of salvation. Every one of those ancestors of the Lord Jesus Christ was an essential link in the plan of God to bring about redemption. We noted last week that most of those people had no idea how they fit into that plan. You and I probably don't have any idea of how we fit into the sovereign plan of God. Most of them had no idea that the women they chose to marry were essential to the plan of God in producing an exact link to the next generation. Most of those people probably did not earnestly seek the face of God concerning whom they ought to marry. They married the woman that they thought was pretty. They married the woman that they thought was talented. They married the woman that they had a desire for. They didn't care about her character or moral purity. They wanted that one. And yet God sovereignly guided every one of them to the right life partner to fulfill his perfect plan for redemption. And the application that we made was God is fulfilling an intergenerational plan with each one of you as well. He's fulfilling an intergenerational plan with me. Back to my grandparents and before them and back to my parents and to me and to my children and to my grandchildren. God has an intergenerational plan for you. You probably never think about how you fit into that intricate and detailed plan of God for the world, but you do. Every one of us does. And we all need to spend some time pondering it. Am I walking the way God wants me to walk so that as I fit into his plan, it brings him the greatest amount of glory and the greatest amount of good for his people and his greatest blessing upon my life? Then we read the genealogy of Jesus through his mother Mary from Luke 3. Now, this is going to be a very interesting discussion, I hope, today. That genealogy lists the human ancestry of Jesus through Mary to prove that Jesus was fully human, just as he is fully God, because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Folks, this is one of the bedrock foundations of the Christian faith, is that Jesus Christ is truly human. 100% human, yet without sin. 
The cults deny this. The Mormons, for example, say that, yeah, Jesus is human on his way to becoming a god. Just like all of us are human on our way to becoming gods. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, Jesus wasn't really human. Uh, Jesus uh, is Michael the Archangel. The Gnostics say, well, Jesus is sort of on that transition stage from matter to non-matter. The Christ of Scripture is truly human. That is one of the foundation elements of the Gospel. We'll see that in a few minutes. Over in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He is truly human. He was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. God chose one of her specific hundreds of thousands of eggs and conceived the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He didn't choose a different seed. He chose that one. And Mary was genetically related to King David. Mary was genetically related to Abraham. Mary was genetically related to Noah. Mary was genetically related to Abraham. Excuse me, to Adam. Jesus Christ is truly human. And Jesus Christ is truly God. Unique in all of history. No other one like him. No other one in that particular genealogical line with that genetic structure which he received from his mother Mary. Mary's genealogy, very important. Now, the genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew, which we did not read last week, but that genealogy in Matthew is the genealogy of Joseph and is given to show the legal right of Jesus to the throne of David. Both of those genealogies trace back to David. But Joseph's genealogy traces back through a man named Kaniah, who is also called Jeconiah in Scripture, and he's also called Jehoiakim, not Jehoiakim, but Jehoiakim in Scripture. And he was cursed by God, prohibiting any of his physical descendants from sitting on the throne of David. So, folks, listen carefully. There are people who say, well, you know, Joseph and Mary had an affair and they just pretended like it was a virgin birth. If Jesus is biological son of Joseph, he cannot sit on the throne of David because Joseph's genealogy traces back through Kaniah or Jeconiah or Jehoiakim, same guy, all three of those names apply to the same man, traces back through Kaniah, who was cursed by God. That's rather important. And by the way, if you want to look at that, the curse is found in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 30. But as you look at Mary's genealogy, which is what I read last week, and I read it very, very fast, because most of you would have gone to sleep by the time I got to the end of it, but I was hoping that you would try to at least catch a few names that you knew out of it. Mary's genealogy in Luke traces back to David through David's son, Nathan. Nathan was one of the four sons of Bathsheba. The first baby, of course, died, but then Bathsheba had four more sons, one of whom was Shlomo, Solomon. But she also had a little boy by the name of Nathan. It's rather interesting. Nathan himself lived in obscurity throughout David's reign while his brothers were contending for the throne. He was like sort of the, the background echo. <laughs> he lived in obscurity. But you know, God chose him to be the ancestor of the Messiah. Think about that for a moment. He appears in the genealogy of Mary in Luke chapter 3, verse 31. We have a lesson I think we can learn from that. Just because you happen to be a big shot like Solomon does not mean, and that was Nathan's brother, it does not mean that the ultimate end of your impact will be as big as the ultimate impact of a brother or sister who never seemed to get ahead in the world. Have you ever heard this principle? God does not always choose the people that men think are great. God does not always choose the people that men think are great. Solomon was a great man. God used Solomon. Solomon wrote a lot of scripture in the Old Testament. 
He wrote Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes. Two very key books in the Old Testament. Solomon was also a great sinner. Solomon married pagan wives who turned his heart away from the Lord at the end of his life. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Solomon sinned. God didn't choose Solomon and one of his 700 wives to be the progenitor of the Messiah. He was a big shot. He was a powerful king. He was a wealthy king. But God said, you got some sin in your life and I'm not going to choose you. I'm not going to send the Messiah through you. I'll send him through your brother that nobody knows anything about. People, living a life of holiness is far more important to God than living the life of the big shot, the rich guy, the powerful guy, the mover of people. Living a life in obscurity can be a life that has the greatest impact in the long run in the world if you are living it squarely in the center of the will of God, a life of holiness, of moral purity, of integrity, of obedience to the Word of God, God uses pure vessels. That's a very important lesson to learn from looking at genealogy, one guy in the genealogy, David's son Nathan through Bathsheba. God doesn't always choose the people that men think are great. Paul says so doctrinally over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 and following, following because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, now it doesn't say not any, because God does choose some, but not many of them, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Why did you get chosen? Are you great? Are you powerful? Are you rich? Are you mighty? If you don't fit that category, it means that you're not one of the few from that category that were chosen, which means you fall into the second category, as do I, with this group that is called the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Are you mighty? Oh, we all like to think we're tough. Uh, when I was pastoring a church in North Jersey many, many years ago, to support myself, I worked at a, a factory that made baby powder and shampoo and things like that. We packaged seven million bottles of Playtex baby shampoo on one occasion. I was in charge of the chemical warehouse. and. Um, there was a guy there who thought he was really tough. He was really mighty. And he would walk into bars. He was a Hispanic guy. He would walk into bars and say, I'm the toughest guy in this place. Look at everybody and then shove people aside and walk up to the bar. Yep, that's exactly right, Ed. Ed knew the answer. <laughs> One day, he walked into a bar and said, I'm the toughest man in this place. And somebody pulled out a gun and shot him dead. Yeah. Not many mighty not many mighty. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things, that's like rubbish. God has chosen the rubbish. Now we don't want to admit to that. But you know what? Most of us, as far as the world is concerned at least, most of us are rubbish. I mean, if you read anything you know, going on in the legal arena right now, they're out there calling the Christians rubbish. God hath chosen the base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught, that is, to bring to nothing, things that are. God says, you know, you people down there, you think you're so tough, you think you're so rich, you think you're so powerful, you think you're so cool, you think you're so Joe with it kind of people. You know what? I'm not going to choose you. I'm going to choose the base things, the rubbish things, the things that you despise, 
the people who are nobodies. That's what God did with Nathan. He makes no big play for the throne. He's not involved in the interfamily politics. He probably had some wisdom from his grandfather Ahithophel and from his mother who got it from her father. And the wisdom was be in the center of God's will. Do what's right. God will use you. God did. God chose him and put him into this list. And God gives us the divine purpose for choosing the foolish things, the weak things, the base things, the despised things, the things which are not. He gives us the reason in verse 29 that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is not going to compete with you. You think you're cool, you think you're powerful, you think you're mighty. Job complained to God. And at the end of the book of Job, God says to him, Okay, Job, God speaks to him out of the whirlwind. He says, All right, Job, gird up your loins like a man. And now answer me these questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? Where were you when I did this? And Job has to fall on his face and say, I repent. Sorry about that. God, I spoke at a turn. I'm nothing. Now, at the beginning of the book of Job, it tells us he was the most powerful, wealthiest, wisest man in all of the East. But when it comes to God, he was nothing. And he admits that at the end of the book of Job. Read the book of Job sometime. I'm reading through it right now. It's got some incredible wisdom in it. If you sit and ponder it, don't just read through the verses. Sit and think about what's saying. Job's friends told him many things that were true, but it wasn't the answer to Job's problem. We know what Job's problem was because we have access to the beginning of the book of Job where we see Satan coming into the presence of God and God giving Satan the, the right to put Job to the test. The friends were stating true theology in many cases, but they didn't know all the facts. When you apply true facts to the wrong case and you don't know all the facts, when you give the wrong solution, you are no help at all. But no flesh should glory in his presence. You know, when we read that genealogy last week, we concluded that most of us know nothing about most of the people that God chose to be the physical ancestors of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you see, God doesn't choose like man chooses. Have you ever wondered why God chose you if you're a believer? Have you ever wondered that? The only conclusion I can come to is I must have been scum. I must have been at the bottom of the barrel because that's where God chooses. He doesn't choose the powerful, the rich, the wise. The point that I made last week was that every one of those people was essential in the plan of God to ultimately give the Messiah to Israel and to ultimately provide a savior for the world. There is nobody in all of history, including you and including me, that is not essential to the plan of God to produce his greatest glory. If you and I were not essential to producing God's greatest glory, because that's what God says he's going to do, if we were not essential to that plan, we would never have existed. You think of all the possible children your parents could have had with the millions of different sperm and the hundreds of thousands of different eggs, the, the humongous variety that could have been produced. And God chose to make sure that you were the one that was conceived and born. Do you think God doesn't have a purpose for your life? You know, something else that I, is fascinating as I think about it, not only is there not anybody in all of history, including us, that's not essential to the plan of God to produce his greatest glory and the greatest good for his elect, but you know, that also puts the enemy in a pickle. Even though the devil is a brilliant strategist, he doesn't know who God is going to use since God chooses weak people like you and like me. 
that boggles the mind. The devil's out there thinking, you know, we're playing a game of chess, devil and God, you know. How am I going to stop God's plan? And God is slowly moving across the board. The devil thinks, ah, God's raising up this one here. I see how he's doing that with Moses. I'm going to try to fix it so that, that Moses gets mad and Moses strikes the rock. And you know what Moses did? And Moses doesn't get to go into the land. The devil thinks I won that one. But God puts Joshua in. And Joshua's the battle leader. Joshua leads them into the land of time quest. And so the devil thinks, i got to get the, God's people into sin. You know, and We have all kinds of things going on. We've got the, uh, the Midianites. We've got Balaam. We've got all kinds of horrible things happening all over the place. The devil's out there fighting as bad as he can, and God is slowly, carefully moving with individual people that the devil doesn't even see them on the board. That's the way you play chess. You make what looks like a, a big-time move over here, but what you're actually thinking about is a, a pawn that's over here. Yeah, the devil's a master strategist, but he doesn't know because he follows the big people. And God is using the little people. God's using you and me. Dear people, you can look at the history in the Old Testament and you can see that over and over and over and over and over again. Because God chooses weak people, so the devil tries to kill everybody that's not directly under his thumb, like Herod the Great. You know, huh, suddenly the devil realizes, and he moves Herod, the devil realizes, God has just sent the Messiah. Oh no, I failed. I, I didn't pay attention to that genealogy. And so he moves Herod to kill all the babies. we got to get him somehow. But God warns Joseph in a dream. And say, take Mary and the young child and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I call thee. For Herod will seek the young child's life to destroy him. God's always one step ahead of where the devil is. In your life, God is one step ahead of where the devil is. If you stay in close contact with the Lord, and as he moves you through your life, you will always be one step ahead of where the devil thinks he's got you. The center of God's will in holiness and moral purity, in obedience to the Word of God, in humility and submission, and in love for Christ, motivating you by everything that you do. Not merely the law, not merely a set of rules that you sort of tick off each morning and then each night. You're motivated by Christ. You're empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. You're focused on eternity, not on time and pleasure and temporal circumstances. The devil tries to kill them all, or like Hitler who tried to kill all the Jews, he figures, well, that's what I can do because God promised that he'd keep Israel uh, alive, and so if I can kill all the Jews, if I can get rid of them like Hitler tried to do, then I win. God chooses. God controls. God patiently makes his moves through history. And we see that in the genealogies. And then he crushes the head of the serpent. Checkmate. All the while providing his very best for those who are his elect. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them were the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, <laughs> think about this what God is doing in your life is conforming you to the image of his son an image reflects perfectly the original when you look into the mirror if you saw Mickey Mouse in the mirror you'd know that somebody had put up like a little sticker or something instead of you reflecting out if you looked into the mirror and you waved and the image in the mirror stuck out its tongue, you know that's not your image. An image reflects the original. And what God is doing is conforming us through the things that we go through in life to the image of Christ. Now I'm going to read you a next phrase here and I want you to pay attention to it. You won't understand yet why I'm reading this phrase and emphasizing it. But listen to the next phrase that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
remember that, we'll come back to it, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That includes the devil. There's a divine chess game going on. A divine battle going on. Military strategies on both sides. The killing of troops. Ambushments. Deceit. Treachery. Treason. A war is going on. We know the end because we have the book of Revelation. But we're living in the middle of a war. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. If Jesus is praying for you, is the Father going to turn him down? Is the Father going to turn him down? No. Who can condemn us? For Christ is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. What shall separate us or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword as it is written? You know, being on God's side doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Paul says so right here. It you can't be beaten. You will suffer, but you can't be beaten. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. That's a rather significant price to pay, isn't it? We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Hey, bring in one of those sheep. Let's kill it and eat it. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We can't be beaten. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, last week I closed by reading you two stories, one about Al Capone's lawyer and one about a courageous fighter pilot in World War II to illustrate the idea of redemption as God works his sovereign plan through genealogies, in that case a father and a son. Let me share with you something personal. My parents taught me a lot of what I call practical wisdom, not just academic theory, not just theology. I got a lot of that from my dad. But my parents also taught me a lot of practical wisdom. And there was an old saying that passed down through several generations of my family going back at least as far as my grandmother, and I think to my great-grandmother. And I don't know where this originated. I'm sure it wasn't original, but it got passed down through my family anyway. My mom taught it to me as a child, and I've never forgotten it. Here it is. For want of a nail, a horseshoe was lost. For want of a horseshoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, a battle was lost. For want of a battle, the war was lost. For want of a nail, a war was lost. Never underestimate your tiny part in the plan of God. Don't be discouraged. You are personally important to Him in the ultimate and glorious fulfillment of His eternal plan. Now, I said I was going to stretch you a little bit. So here I go. I want to stretch you, stretch your mind a little bit. Do I have your permission to stretch your mind? 
If not, I've warned you. So clamp your mind shut like a steel trap for the next few minutes. I want to pick up our study of genealogies by going back for a few minutes to the genealogy of Mary that we read in Luke. Are you aware of the fact that this same maternal genealogy applies to Mary's other children by her husband Joseph? But every one of those children, because Joseph was their father, Every one of them could not ever claim the throne of David because Joseph was in the cursed line of Kaniah. We talked about that a few minutes ago. But it is clear from Scripture that Jesus had brothers and sisters. Mary had at least four sons and two daughters by Joseph. We're told that twice in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 13, 55, where the crowd is questioning where they've been listening to Jesus and watching him do miracles. They're offended at him. And they say, what? Why should we believe this guy? Is this, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Mark tells us a little more information about that. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? Of course, they were wrong when they said it is not his, his father Joseph because they didn't know that. The son of Mary the brother of James and Joseph and of Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us and they were offended at him you know as you look at that there are four boys mentioned and it says sisters plural so there are at least two girls there might have been more girls we don't know they're not named for us but there are at least six other children that Mary bore she had at least seven kids and six of those kids were by her husband Joseph. Now, put that back in your thoughts of your mind for a moment. Although the brothers of Christ did not initially believe on him, we're told that in the scripture, one of the brothers of Jesus became a leader in the early church. In fact, he was what you might call the moderator of the council at Jerusalem. By the way, I want to mention one other thing before we go on. Those two verses that I just read you put the lie to the Roman Catholic theory that uh, Mary was a perpetual virgin. Mary had a normal relationship with her husband, Joseph, after Jesus was born. It says he knew her not until Jesus was born. Implication? He knew her after that. He had physical relations with Mary after that and produced at least six more kids whose names are listed for us here in the text. But James, one of those was the moderator of the first council at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15, verses 12 and following. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after that they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. It was the half-brother of Jesus who settles the issue at the first church council in Jerusalem so that the church accepted Gentiles into the body of Christ that's you and me James also received Paul upon his return from the third missionary journey Acts chapter 21 verses 17 and following and when we were come to Jerusalem the brethren received us gladly and the day following Paul went in with us unto James and all the elders were present and when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles in his ministry. James, the half-brother of Christ, was also the author of the book of James in the New Testament. Did you know that we know that James was married? And so are the other brothers of Christ. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as the other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas. So the Roman Catholic Church's idea that the Pope has to be single, and they claim Peter is their first Pope, we're told right here that Peter was married. Cephas is the other name that was given to Peter. Okay, so now I want to stretch your thinking. Think about this. If the half-brothers and half-sisters of Jesus had children, are you ready? There may be people in the world today that are genetically related to Christ. 
And I suspect the devil has followed that line pretty closely. You know, he probably tried to wipe them out. But we don't know. No, it's not the outrageous claim made by the Da Vinci Code of Ron Brown that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and that she was the Holy Grail who bore children to him. But Jesus had brothers and sisters who were the biological children of Mary, and Jesus was the biological son of Mary. Unique, different from all the rest, not part of the cursed line of Kaniah, but going back through Nathan, David's son by Bathsheba. Let me stretch you even further. The genuine humanity of Christ is proven by his genealogy, which is traced back through Noah to Adam. Paul calls Christ the second Adam because his work undoes what Adam did, reverses the curse for sin for those who are in Christ, even as all of us who are in Adam die. Now here's the stretch. <laughs> Think about it. That means that you personally are genetically related to Jesus Christ someplace back along the line to Noah and Adam. Jesus did not have the genetic DNA of a monkey. He did not have the genetic DNA of a banana. He had the genetic DNA that traces back very clearly in Mary's genealogy to David and back to Abraham and back to Noah and back to Adam. Do you understand the impact and significance of that genealogy in Luke chapter 3? That makes him a true human being. And if you are a true human being, you trace back to Adam which means that you are genetically related to the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about the implications of that in a minute. You know, secular scientists have come to what they are puzzling over, what they call mitochondrial Eve. That is, they've discovered by checking the DNA of people all over the globe that all of them go back to a single woman. They have a hard time wrestling with that, of course, if it's perfectly the creation model. But we're all related to each other all over the face of the globe. I mean, you and, you know, Hitler are somehow related. <laughs> now, we don't want to like to include him in our genealogy back then, but we're related if we're human beings. We don't like to be related to Stalin and Lenin. We don't like to be related to, you know, Mao Zedong. We don't like to be related to the, you know, cannibals in Africa. We don't like to be, but we are. We are someplace back there in the distant foggy past, and you and I can hardly even name our great-grandparents and who their children were, were related. Biologically and genetically related to all those people out there. Somehow I'm related to you. I don't like to admit that. <laughs> but somehow I'm related to you. And you may not like to admit you're related to me. <laughs> Especially after this sermon, right? You know, as you look at that, the genuine humanity of Christ is one of the key elements of the Gospel because he is literally, and it says so, of the seed of David. He is literally, and it says so, of the seed of Abraham. Let me read to you Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Listen to this careful. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. He's talking about the gospel. He's going to list the same elements that he does in 1 Corinthians 15. Which he had a promise to for by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Now listen to the next phrase. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Jesus is a literal, physical descendant of David. So that means at the very least that all those people who are literal physical descendants of David who still may be alive on the face of the earth today are all genetically related to Jesus. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now you know that second point that I made that you and I are related to the Lord Jesus Christ and also that related to Abraham. Let me read you from Hebrews chapter 2. We're called his brothers there. 
For we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that is sanctified, and they who are sanctified, are all of one, for which cause, now listen, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Folks, he's talking about the real humanity of Christ and the purpose for the real humanity of Christ and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now listen, now he, the first passage in Romans, he tied us to, tied Jesus to David. Now he's going to tie him to Abraham. Listen, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, so that shoots down that Jehovah's Witness theory that we talked about earlier, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, a real human being that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted he is able to also succor them that are tempted do you get the impact of that you are important to God he did this for you he brought Jesus into the genetic line of humanity to suffer for your sins and for my sins. Not just other children of Mary are genetically related to Jesus, but Mary's genealogy is traced all the way back to Adam. And you and I are all sons of Adam and daughters of Adam. And we're all under the curse. We're all in Adam. In Adam all die. But God reached down into the morass as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And he chose the filthy things, the dirty things, the weak things, the poor things, the stupid things to bring all those powerful people to nothing so that no flesh should glory in his presence and he made Jesus genetically related to us so that he might die for us so that he might call us brethren and that in the end that God would get the glory you are important to God that is proved by what Jesus did for you and for me our time is up gracious Heavenly Father we thank you once again for your power and for your word and for your grace that Christ the Lord of heaven would become one of us he would take on him the seed of Abraham he would be the seed of David he would be the seed of the woman literally stated in Genesis 3.15 the seed of the woman. That he would be related to us. What a step down into the filthy sewer of this world. Because he loved us and wanted to rescue us and pull us out. And he shed his blood and he gave his life to do it because he loved us thank you father we don't deserve it we don't deserve it and we fall on our face before you in humility because Jesus loved us and because he gave himself for us thank you father in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 